Um, first, I'm going to talk about the general practice of mocking, what it is, how it works, why we do it, all the related terminology, etc. Um, I'm also going to discuss how the mocking libraries for PHP that are out there function at a high level so that you understand how they work so you can better use them. Um, and then I'm going to dive into some of the more commonly used features of a specific library called Fake. Um, I will be drawing some uh, correlations uh, insofar as how PHP Unit's own mocking library functions and uh, points of integration that Fake offers with PHP Unit where they're relevant. All right, so um, first off, if you are not already relatively well familiar with PHP as a language and its object model, a lot of this talk is probably going to be over your head. So apologies, we just we have a limited amount of time to cover this material. Um, lastly, to a lesser degree, knowing PHP in it will help. Uh, as I said, I'll be mentioning it several times in the talk, so if you're already familiar with it, a lot of this stuff will already make sense to you to some degree. Okay, so I'll go ahead and get right in here. Um, installing fake is, uh, is relatively simple. Uh, how many people familiar with Composer have used it? Good, I like that number of fans. It needs to go up, but good start. Um, so you have the option to install it with Composer. You can also clone the, uh, the Git repository directly. To my knowledge, there aren't any other installation options that are offered. Uh, I highly recommend just using Composer. It makes things a lot easier. Uh, Fake does have documentation, um, and I highly recommend you review it. Uh, there are areas of it that are a bit sparse or may be able to be improved in terms of the examples. So uh, the maintainer, who I'll show you here in a second, uh, is very receptive to pull requests and suggestions on improvements. I know that because I've had to go back and forth with him a bit myself. Um, so check that out. Okay, so this is Mike. Uh, he's very friendly, receptive to feedback. I've filed multiple bug reports, PRs with him. Uh, there are a few things that are not quite fully baked yet that I'll mention further in the talk as we find them. Uh, but Mike has several other uh, repositories. If you've worked with the DB unit extension to PHP unit at all, he was responsible for writing that in its original incarnation. So, great guy. All right, so unit testing. Um, there's been a big focus on testing in general in our industry within the past few years. Um, unit testing tends to be the form that most people are familiar with. It's the form that tends to be emphasized the most when talking about testing. Um, a lot of people don't necessarily learn as part of that education the different types of tests there are, how they're different, and when it's more appropriate to use them. So uh, in unit testing, I wanted to stress that what you're trying to do is test the lowest level parts of your code. Uh, and importantly, you're doing them in isolation from each other. Um, so that when you're testing one piece of code that may be dependent on another piece of code, um, that you are properly limiting the code that you're actually testing to the class under test rather than testing both of them together because that's a different type of testing that we'll talk about here in a minute. Okay, so most of you have probably heard of PHP unit. Um, there are a few other testing frameworks out there, but by and large, it tends to be sort of the de facto one that people tend to use out in the community. Um, it's modeled, if you've used JUnit before, you probably uh, re will recognize a lot of the concepts from, the, from its Java counterpart. Uh, this is Sebastian Bergman, he's the maintainer of PHP Unit, along with a lot of other supporting libraries for it. Uh, great guy, we've talked back and forth over the years. Uh, I don't think he's here, unfortunately, but uh, you can check out more posts from him. He's got a blog, he talks about PHP Unit quite a bit. Uh, he's a great resource. Okay. So integration testing is the other type of uh, testing that I alluded to, and this is where you test uh, points where you're actually combining multiple different sets of code, generally speaking, classes uh, in your code base, and you're testing those integrations. Um, one rather interesting example that I saw visually, and unfortunately I didn't capture at the time, was uh, two doors in a building that are set side by side that open this way, and individually the doors open just fine, but if you try to open them both at the same time, they hit each other and they don't open. That's an example of where unit tests would pass, but the integration test would fail, to give you an idea. Um, so as an example, one specific form of integration testing that I mentioned before is database testing, which the, uh, the DB unit extension to PHP unit uh, covers, that sort. Um, so if you've ever had a test like this 
this is not a unit test. This is an integration test, and it's very important to distinguish them uh, for reasons that we'll go into here in a second. So where unit tests are more appropriate is, uh, are cases where, say, your code is contacting a third-party API. You don't necessarily want to hit the API actively in, as part of your test. You want to limit that to production. Um, so this may be a good case where mocking will do something for you. Essentially, it will let you uh, inject a fake version of the client for this API and have that code simply return a response as if it had actually hit the service so that you're able to test, but you don't actually have to hit the active service yourself. Um, one uh, con to this is that if I have a piece of code and it's dependent on uh, a separate class, if I change that dependent class, uh, tests from both suites may start to fail. Whereas with mocking, since you're specifically programming behavior into the mock objects, if you change the dependent class, your test uh, won't necessarily fail for the code that's dependent on it. So it's important to understand that in cases with an integration test, if I change an, un an underlying class in a way that's not compatible, both tests would start failing and I wouldn't necessarily know why. So this is an example of a class that we might like to test. So here, uh, I'm programming uh, a client for a specific REST service. Um, I'm using the Guzzle HTTP client library, which if you're not familiar is great, check it out. Um, so I'm injecting an instance of the low-level HTTP client that Guzzle provides into the constructor here. Um, and then somewhere else in the class, I'm actually using that client to hit the web service. So we want to be able to um, test my class, but we don't want to rely on Guzzle's implementation of this interface in order to be able to do it, because if something in Guzzle changes, well then suddenly I have tests that may be failing all over the place and I don't know why. I may not necessarily realize that, the, that an upgrade, say, caused it. Um, all I want to know by my unit tests for this class is that the, the functionality in this class is correct. All right, anybody heard the phrase test doubles before? A few of you, okay. Um, Okay, so when I talk about uh, mock objects, what I mean is basically that we're going to create objects that, in the case of my uh, the previous code example that I used, will have the same uh, public interface as this client that I'm injecting. But the thing is, is that I will basically tell those methods exactly how to behave. I'll tell them uh, what values to return. I'll tell them if they need to do anything that may be specific to the test. Um, I'm basically taking the, the original logic out of the equation and I'm telling it, okay, this is the behavior that I want to test my code with. So if you return this value, I'm gonna test for this. If you want to return that value, I wanna test for that. And test levels are what let us do this. Um, so yeah, the term uh, test levels is used as sort of a more general phrase to encompass a few different concepts. One of these is mock objects. So essentially these are objects that, like I say, mimic the same a uh, public interface and the behavior of the actual class in a controlled way. So I could, for example, create a mock of this HTTP client and then say, I want you to return this specific response. This is the behavior that I want you to, to, to exhibit while, while I'm testing this specific code. Okay, so um, we have something of a problem. We can't just uh, create mock objects uh, from anything. We actually have to create objects that, in particular, will pass type in checks. So if you notice in my code back here, sorry, it's in the constructor, I'm uh, type hinting the client interface variable that I want to inject. So in order for this to work with my, in order for this uh, mock that I want to inject to work with my code, it has to pass this check. Um, so given PHP object, P, sorry, PHP's object model, um, if I want to mock a class, then the mock object has to be a subclass of it, uh, essentially. If I want to mock an interface, the mock object has to implement that interface. Um, so in either one of these circumstances, the mock object I would be able to pass in and it would pass the type in check and be able to go on its merry way. Okay, so this is an example of what mocking an object actually looks like in fake. Um, so taking my previous example, if I have this Rust client that I want to test, um, I've got this test case, I want to test the, its constructor to make sure that the uh, dependency injection works sufficiently. Um, so I'm calling uh, the mock 
uh, static method on the fake class. I'm specifying the class that I want to get a mock object of, and then I'm passing it in. Uh, now you'll see, just for the purposes of example, I'm outputting something here, which is the class uh, that the mock object is an instance of. And you'll see it, it's, it looks like garbage here, and I'll explain a bit more as we go along why this is the way it is. But um, for the moment, just to give you an idea of what mocking an object in fake looks like at a, in a very simplistic circumstance, uh, that's what this code reflects. Okay. So if I have a mock object and I want to replace the behavior of a specific method, that process is called stubbing. Um, so if I want it to return specific values, throw an exception, uh, or something of that nature, uh, stubbing would be what I would be doing. So let's take an actual look at some code. So here in my Rust client, I've got a method called getThing, and I'm passing it some specific ID. Um, so uh, further down, I'm actually calling the get method on the client that I've injected, the, the instance of uh, the Guzzle client. And I'm uh, passing it in a specific URL that includes the ID that I passed in. I get a response back. And then at that point, I take that response object and I'm returning uh, the, response in, uh, the response body, which I'm assuming to be JSON. So what we're going to have to do here is we have to modify the behavior of the client object such that when I call get, it's going to return a response object, as would be appropriate if I was actually hitting the service. Then we have to take that response object and stub its JSON method so that it returns the right thing, essentially. Um, so when doing this, Sorry, to go back real quick. In doing this, what will end up happening is that get thing will return whatever the response object's JSON method stub returns. And I'll be able to verify that my method does exactly what you see here. So looking at what a test like this would look like, um, I'm not, I've omitted a lot of the, uh, the PHP unit uh, boilerplate code just for the sake of simplicity. So just consider that you would have these use directives at the top of your test suite, and then the code below it would be one of your tests. Um, so here, uh, I've got the data that I would assume the web service will be returning for this specific request. Um, further down, I'm calling fake mock. I need to get my response uh, mock object that the client will return when I actually make the uh, request. Because at that point, I need to say, OK, on this response mock, I need its JSON uh, method to return this data. Um, following that, I'm mocking the client, and then I'm telling it when this get request comes through, then this get method is called, then I need you to return this mock response object that I've created. So at that point, I inject the mock HTTP client into my Rust client class. Uh, I call the public method on that Rust client, get thing, pass it a value, and then when I get that thing back, I'm checking it against the data that I told the response to return to verify that my method get thing actually makes the request, gets the response back, returns the JSON equivalent. I know it's a bit much to follow. Does anybody have any questions before we move on? Does this make sense? Good. All right. So um, there are several different behaviors that you can uh, use when you stub methods. Uh, fake refers to these as answers. I haven't really seen a, uh, a consistent use of terminology there. So uh, PHP unit's own mocking library may run something different. I call it something different. Um, so by default, all mock object methods uh, in a fake mock object will return null. That's its default behavior. They won't do anything else otherwise. It's basically a no-op. Um, so other things that you can do, you can have it return a specific value. You can have it invoke a callback. This callback will receive any arguments that the mock object's method receives when you call it, and then will return whatever that callback returns. So effectively, it allows you to do it to inject some specific logic into the stub that you want to have happen. Um, it can also throw an exception. Uh, that's, uh, that's a use case that you want to test. Uh, fake also allows you to program your own custom answers if you want to go even further than this, but these are kind of your basic ones. So there are some other issues with this whole mocking process. Excuse me. Um, so you'll remember earlier that I said that if I wanted to mock a class, essentially what, this, what fake is doing is uh, creating a subclass 
of the class that I'm mocking. Um, and then I'm able to create stubs on those methods. Now, in the case of private methods, those are not accessible to subclasses. They can't be invoked by a subclass. Only the original parent class can see them. Um, so you can test private methods directly. Uh, in fact, there's a uh, feature in PHP's reflection library that was added specifically for this purpose to where you can actually uh, change the accessibility of the method. Uh, the only caveat to this is that the method itself can't be invoked directly. Effectively, what PHP is doing is giving you a reference to that method that you can call in the context of some specific object. Um, and I'll show you a bit more what that looks like in a second. It's a bit odd. But, um, so fake does have a feature to support calling non-public methods on mocks. Um, it's a little difficult to follow. Hopefully the example that I'll show you here in a minute will kind of clarify how it works. Um, overall though, I would generally encourage you to test private methods by calling the public methods that call them. It's just easier to deal with, saves you a, a lot of headache. Um, so let's look at some actual examples of what this looks like. So here I've got a class, it's got a private method uh, that I want to be able to invoke. So what I'm doing is uh, I've got a parameter that I want to pass it called dbrow. I'm calling the partial mock method of fake, passing it the name of the class. Uh, it's giving me the mock object instance. I am then taking that instance, passing it to fake's make visible method. And at that point, um, I'm able to invoke any non-public methods on this object directly, as you can see here. Um, I believe this works uh, under the hood by using some proxies. There's some sort of dark magic there that I don't quite understand, to be perfectly honest. So um, typically speaking, uh, uh, there's also the method by which you can use the reflection API that I mentioned to, uh, to do this directly. I believe fake uses this under the hood somewhere. Um, so what I'm doing is I've got my class, I've got my private method. Um, uh, instantiating reflection method, specifying the class and the method that I want to invoke. I'm calling set accessible on that reflection method instance and passing it true. And then at that point, on that same method instance, I'm calling invoke and I'm passing it an instance of the class. So this method will be uh, invoked in the context of this class as though this instance was represented by the special this variable that you normally see in classes. Um, this is another option, generally speaking, as I said, it's probably better to just test private methods by invoking public ones. Your tests end up being a lot less messy for it. Um, okay, so another problem, static methods can't be stubbed because they're bound to the original parent class name. Um, you can do this uh, if you are using late static binding in your class. That's a whole subject on its own. Um, and I've included some references here in both fake and PHP unit as to how this works, and I'll show you an example. Um, in fake, I'm not quite sure this is working right yet. I'm hoping Mike will fix it. He's aware of the problem. So, but just to give you an idea of how it should work, um, I've got my class. I've got a public property called logger. I've got a method that actually does something with this logger object. In particular, uh, it calls this static log data method on it. Now, by default, I'm uh, using the string logger, which refers to a logger class somewhere so that when this static method is invoked, it's just invoked based on the class name. Now, the way that I understand it, what PHP will do is that if logger, uh, as part of that log data call, is an instance, PHP will just resolve it to the class and then invoke the corresponding static method. That's how it's supposed to work. Um, so in my test here, I'm creating uh, a mock object for the logger. I'm invoking the method on my actual foo class, and then I'm calling a fake verify to confirm that the log data method was actually called uh, with whatever parameters were available. Um, so just something to be aware of in case it uh, does start working in a release fairly soon, but um, there's an easier way that I tend to recommend is that, uh, well, one, try to avoid using statics in the first place, quite honestly. I think they're more of an edge case feature in the language, but that's my opinion. Um, so how you can do this is that if, say, your code has to make a call to a static method in some other library, you're probably going to find yourself in that situation. Um, what I'm doing here is that I've got this class with a static method that I want to call. I've got my own class, uh, 
that's actually calling it. What I'm basically doing here is I'm taking that static method call, I'm wrapping it in an instance method, and I'm just invoking the static method and returning whatever it returns. Because at this point, uh, because the protected method is, well, sorry, because my instance method is protected and because it's an instance method, when I get to around to actually mocking my class, uh, what I can do is uh, stub the instance method that I've created, essentially. So that's one way of sort of indirectly stubbing a static method. It's not uh, pretty, but it works. So that's an option to be aware of. Okay. Final methods, I think, are the last large problem that I'll talk about um, as far as the whole way that mocking works. Um, so if you're not familiar with final, essentially it prevents you from overriding methods uh, or in the case of classes, extending classes. So you can't stub final methods and you can't mock or stub uh, final classes. So if you notice in my example here, uh, if you do attempt to stub a final method, it, the code will run but the behavior will not actually be changed. The stub will not actually take effect, so to speak. The original behavior will be invoked. So just something to be aware of. Okay, so um, this code example is fairly similar to the last one that I used with static methods. Essentially, I'm just wrapping the final method call in an instance method of another class, and then I'm stubbing that instance method. So it's the exact same approach. Allows you to get around this issue. Just an option, again, not uh, not, what, not my preference, I just tend to prefer code that doesn't use final in general, but. Okay, there's, sorry, there's one other small caveat. You can stub any method um, because the way that fake mock objects work under the hood, they actually do use call already themselves for making all the mocking magic, magic happen. So um, if for some reason you do want to stub call, uh, in this instance, what you can do is you can either stub the method that call would trigger uh, because it doesn't exist when you call it, or you can do, uh, use a special notation to stub call itself. So uh, in that instance, on my last two lines here, I'm calling uh, when call method with on fake, passing it the name of the method that I would be calling that doesn't actually exist. Uh, the second parameter is any arguments that I would want to have passed to that method when it's called. Um, I'm specifying the mock object that I expect the method to be called on, and then I'm specifying the stub that I want to be used. So, aside from call, though, pretty much any other method should be able to be mocked, or stubbed, rather, excuse me, uh, as normal. Um, so there may be instances where, depending on what parameters are passed into a specific method of the mock object, you may want to vary the stub that's used. So here, what I'm doing is I've got a class it, takes, it has one method, takes two parameters, and it just returns the sum. So when I mock this class, I may, uh, obviously I'm going to want to vary the return value based on the parameters that are passed in. So uh, I specify that if I call add with 0 and 2, I want it to return 2. If I call it with 2 and negative 2, I want it to return 0. Um, so if assuming you want to have multiple calls to the same method with different arguments, exhibit different behavior, this would be how you would specify that the mock object should behave this way. Okay, if you want to make multiple calls to the same method with the same arguments and still have the, the stub behavior vary, what you do in that instance is you start to stub the method as normal. You just call fake when, pass it the mock, specify the method that you want to call, and then you chain multiple then return calls off of uh, that method in the case of if you want to return a value. The other stubs should, uh, answers should work the same way. Um, so for the first, it'll match to the first call, second to the second call, and then the last time that I chain, if I if say I called read bytes a fourth time, it would use the last return value that I specified. Any questions so far? Are we good? Okay. All right. Um, so if you want to override stubs, a good use case for this is say, your mock object is going to exhibit the same behavior like 90% of the time in your tests, and you don't want to have to specify uh, all the setup for that mock object in each test method. Um, what you can do is, uh, in the case of PHP unit, in your setup method, where you would normally put any logic that's going to be used on each test, um, you can put in that 90-95% behavior 
set up in there, and then in tests where you don't want the mop to behave that way, you can then simply overwrite the stub by redefining it in the test. So say, in the original behavior, I want the get value method on this mock object to return 42 in, in most of my cases. And then for one test, I want it to return 37 instead. In that test, I would simply put in this 37 line. And then in my setup method, I would put in this 42 line. And that would work. So bearing in mind, anytime you uh, configure a stub the same way, it will overwrite whatever was there before. So something to be aware of. OK. So let's say that you don't want to stub a method. Let's say that you have a method that simply has some internal effect on state um, that you don't want. You, you're not going to have anything that's returned. You have nothing that you can really verify as a result of the method being called. You just want to know that the method was called by your code. Um, so fake effectively functions as a, sort of a tape recorder where uh, it will record all the calls that are made on the mock object. And then after those calls happen, you can then tell fake, OK, I need you to verify that this specific method was called with these arguments. So as an example of this, let's say that I have uh, in, in one of a, uh, let's call it an event-driven application. Those seem to be becoming more popular these days. And I've got an event emitter class. It has an emit method. I can pass it the name of an event and some arguments. And then let's say I have a plugin class that uses this event emitter. And when I call a method on the plugin class, it has to event, emit a specific event. Notice I'm not returning a value from emit. It does whatever it does, but it doesn't give me a result back. So I have no way to verify that it was called by result value. So what I need to do is write a call to fake to verify that this call actually happens. So this is what that would look like. I'm creating a mock object for the event emitter. I'm passing that to the plugin class. I'm calling my method that should fire off the event. And then I'm using fake's verify method to verify that the emit method was called with the arguments that I passed to it when I called you thing, which I need to fix, because apparently that's a typo in the code example. Sorry. Um, anyway, does everyone follow what, what's going on here? OK, other than that one error, I think my code sample was correct. All right. So let's say that I want to verify multiple invocations of the same method, but with different parameter values. I can do that as well. So here, I've got a class, got a method that I want to stub, or uh, rather verify calls for. Excuse me. Um, so I create a mock of this class. Uh, I invoke my method with the two different arguments. And then at that point, I'm able to call fake's verify method, uh, specify the method that should have been called, and specify the argument that should have been passed to it when it was called. Note that I'm actually in, uh, doing these verifications out of order. Fake doesn't care about that in this context. All it cares about is that the methods were invoked at some point. It doesn't have any concept of them being invoked in relation to each other in this example. Now, we're going to talk about how to make it do that next. So I've got a class. It's got several methods. I need to verify that they're executed in some order. Uh, maybe you've got an e-commerce project, and you may need to send off orders to fulfillment, uh, validate a credit card, send an email, whatever you need to do. Um, and you may want to do these things in a certain order because if, some, if there's an issue in, in the process, you want to stop it at that point, say, just hypothetical. Um, so I've got my class. I'm creating my mock object. I'm invoking these methods. Fake has an in-order method. And all I'm basically doing is wrapping all of my other verify calls in this method. And what fake will do is verify the do thing was called, at some point thereafter, do other thing was called. At some point thereafter, do last thing was called. It doesn't care about any calls in between. It just cares that these calls happen and that they happen in this order in relation to each other. That clear? Is mud better, hopefully? Yeah. All right. If for some reason you have a method that you expect to be called multiple times with the same parameters, I'm not, honestly not sure exactly what the use case for this is, but um, so in this instance, what I'm doing is I'm invoking the method that I'm testing using the same code as the previous example. Um, what I'm doing here is when I specify that I want to ver do a, a method verification on this mock object, uh, as a second parameter to verify, I'm specifying a return value of fake times two. 
So this will confirm that this method was invoked twice with these parameters. Um, there are other things that, methods that you can use off of fake so you can verify that it was invoked at least this many times, at most as many times, excuse me, or never, uh, which I think is just an alias for time zero. Okay, if you for some reason want to verify that no interaction with the mock happens at all, say um, you make a call to a REST service, that call fails, you want to verify that you don't interact with your database to store any data that is the result of that call because the, the, rest, the uh, call failed. So in this instance, I've got a thing doer class, I've got a stuff doer class that depends on it, and then based on this uh, do thing parameter that I'm passing to do stuff, it may or may not invoke the method on uh, the thing doer class. So when I mock thing doer, pass it to stuff doer, I call do stuff with a value of false. So at this point, I know that the do thing method on my thing doer class should not be invoked because of the value that I'm passing to do stuff. So at that point, I can tell fake, okay, verify that no interaction happens with this mock object because I know that it shouldn't based on what I'm passing it. Okay, so uh, going further with that, if I want to verify that some interaction may have happened but no interaction happens after a certain point, I can do that as well. Uh, so same code as the previous example. Uh, when I'm calling do stuff with true, at that point, the thing doer method should be called. I know that. So at this point, I tell fake, okay, some interactions may have happened before now, but after this point where I'm telling you no further interactions should happen, verify that for me. So uh, the code in this test, because my next line uh, invokes the do stuff method such that the thing method won't be invoked, uh, this test should pass. All right. So this is an instance where I want to basically tell fake, okay, I'm gonna tell you what uh, calls I wanna verify. I want you to check that only these calls were ever made on this mock. So in all of my previous examples, uh, we told fake what, what method calls we were expecting. Other method calls can still happen. We're just not telling fake to verify them. So if for some reason you want to say verify that these methods and only these methods are called, this is how you would do it. Um, in this example, I've got a myFilter class um, and it's gonna receive an instance of my list class here. So this uh, filter has a method called add even to list, and the whole point is just to add even numbers to a list object that I give it. So after I make this call, at this point, the list should have two and four in it. So uh, when I call fake verify, I'm telling it, okay, you should expect a call uh, to a push method with the number two and with the number four, and no other uh, calls should occur on that mock. So given that, again, uh, assuming the code worked the way that you would think it would, looking at this example, the test would pass. Okay. Um, so verifying math magic methods basically works the same way as it does uh, with stubbing them. So in here, uh, instead of calling win, uh, I'm just simply calling verify and passing it the same name as the, uh, the method that I would expect, expect to be called. Um, again, because the double underscore call magic method is used by fake, you have to call a different method to check that it was uh, invoked. So I'm calling verify call method with giving it the name of the method, the arguments that I expect to be passed, and then calling is called on with the mock that I expect it to be invoked on. So essentially same story, second verse. Okay. Um, you may be testing code where you do not necessarily know um, the specific value that a, a stub will receive when it's called. You may know something about that value. You may know that it's, say, greater than 10, but you don't know exactly what the, method, what the value is going to be. Um, so in that instance, PHP unit actually has uh, what it calls constraints, which you can pass in place of um, a specific value when you are stubbing a method to say that, okay, I don't know what this method is gonna receive on this mock object when it's called, I just know that this is, you know, it's gonna meet these criteria. Um, so fake supports using these methods of PHP unit 
Uh, greater than 10 is just a particular example. It's got a number of different constraints, and I've linked to a list of them up here. Um, you can also uh, implement your own matchers uh, using fakes uh, interfaces. So you can implement a class with using this interface um, and say it should take this argument and then verify that it meets this criteria. Um, so this allows for a lot of flexibility and, uh, and code reuse with regard to verifying the nature of your stub parameters. Okay, here's a few more examples of these. Um, so for individual parameters, uh, PHP unit has an anything constraint that it will just take whatever and it will always return true. So you can use that if you don't know anything about the parameter other than that it should be there. Um, let's see, for the case of uh, when you want to stub a method and you don't really care what the parameters are, you just expect it to always have the same behavior regardless of what parameters are passed to it. Uh, you would call it this way. Uh, so fake when mock, you specify the method name. Note that I'm, I, I'm not calling it with parentheses here. Uh, fake will interpret this as, okay, they're stubbing this method, but they don't care what's passed in. So at that point, you can simply chain normally, and it will use that stub for all calls to that method. Um, lastly, if there are cases where you're stubbing a method, uh, and it may have a lot of parameters that you don't care about, uh, you can simply, in the place of the first parameter that you don't care about, specify fake ignore remaining, and it will simply use that stub for any uh, cases where, in this specific example, foo and bar are passed as the first and second parameters, but uh, it doesn't matter what the rest are. It'll just simply return bar for uh, all those cases. Okay. Um, there may be cases where I want to... Um, capture specific parameters, uh, say they may be objects uh, that may be of a complex nature and I want to verify multiple things about those objects uh, using PHP and its assertions, I can simply call fake capture when, I, uh, when I'm doing a verification. And what fake will do is it will look, verify that the method call actually happened and then whatever was passed, um, this fake capture call will store it in this variable which I'm passing in by reference and then at that point, I can do whatever it is that I want to do, any, any checks on those parameters. So that's mainly the use case for this, is that if you have complex objects or some other sort of type that uh, you don't necessarily just want to use simple constraints for, uh, this is a handy feature to use. Okay. Um, so in verifications, um, if we want to... Uh, capture parameters, but we want to also perform uh, constraint checks on them at the same time. Uh, that's what this would allow. So in this case, I'm both capturing all params and inline, when I chain this, this, uh, this win call, um, I'm passing in a constraint. In this case, it's the uh, is type constraint, and I'm specifying that it should be an array. Uh, this is one of PHP unit's constraints. Um, so that constraint will be applied to uh, this parameter when I capture it. And at that point, if it doesn't match the verification, the test will fail. Okay. Um, one of the criticisms that I got when I first gave this talk was that a lot of people already had test suites set up where they were already using PHP units native mocking. Um, and they Effectively, they were in an organization large enough that if they were going to affect the change of using a library like fake, that they needed to be able to make a business case for it. So I've added on these slides to kind of show you uh, PHP and its native mocking behavior as compared to what fake does. So both of the examples here, when I'm trying to create a mock object, um, these have the same effect. Uh, there are two different styles of uh, calling. The bottom one is older. The top one was added more recently to make code a bit more uh, semantically meaningful. Um, so all of these calls will result in basically what fake does when you simply call fake mock. Um, PHP and it offers a lot of different features. Um, I, some of these I haven't really found a use for, like when you mock a class, you can actually specify the name of the uh, mock subclass that it will create. Um, I've I can't recall a single instance where I've had to use that feature. So um, 
calls like this, if you need to override some specific aspect of the mock's behavior, uh, can be cumbersome and difficult to read. So this is one instance where it simply makes your test suites better because you can understand at a glance exactly what's going on. Okay. With regard to PHP unit stubbing features, one thing that I don't like about the design is that it conflates the uh, APIs for stubbing and for verification, and this limits how you can use it. Um, so in this instance, I'm saying that uh, on this HTTP object, I should expect the get method to be called exactly once. Um, a lot of people will take this code example and read that this means get will be called once with this parameter, and it may be called other times, which is not correct. This is expecting that the method will be called exactly once with this specific parameter, and it will have this specific behavior. Um, so the fake code for this is a bit longer, but it's clearer as to what's going on. And this uh, also gives me the ability to uh, change how many times I expect that method to be called. Or if I don't care how often it's called, I only care about stubbing it, I don't have to worry about the verification side effects of PHP and its API. Um, so that's essentially the, the advantage here with these APIs. Okay, if you want to stub multiple calls, uh, in my opinion, the way for doing this in PHP unit is kind of messy. Um, essentially, they implemented doing it two different ways. So you can use what they call a value map, where you specify uh, the arguments that you expect to receive, and then the return value that you want to use, and you have to do this for every single call. Uh, that may happen. Uh, the other way is that you can actually specify a callback, which is equivalent to, uh, to using the then return callback uh, answer in fake. Um, it will receive the arguments that are passed to the stub. You can perform some custom logic and then return whatever values are appropriate. But I mean, quite honestly, for the use case, this gets kind of cumbersome. So compare it with fake's API where I can simply inline very semantically specify, okay, I expect do thing to be called with these arguments and then return this value. It's very readable, it's very straightforward. Um, you can tell exactly how it should work by looking at the code as opposed to if you haven't read the documentation for these features, you may not quite understand it by just looking at the code necessarily. Um, I just think it's, it makes the t test suite more readable. Do it this way. Okay, this is a big one. Um, because the APIs here are conflated, the way that I would verify order in PHP unit is that I would call expects with the, this at, and I would specify uh, an index of the call that I want to verify starting from zero. The problem with this is that it makes your test suite very brittle. So this will allow you to verify order, but if I have to inject a call and at any point in this order, it, it will suddenly cause tests to fail. I'll have to go back, look at the indexes, remember the order of calls. It's just very, very cumbersome, and it's not very readable. And because these stubbing and verification APIs are conflated, this is the only way to verify order uh, in that API. Compared with, as I mentioned earlier, in the case of fake, I make the same verify calls that I would normally make. The difference is, is I don't have to worry about indexes at all. And I don't have to worry about any calls that may happen in between. If all I care about is that these specific methods were called in this specific order, I can express that and it's not fragile at all. If I have to add a call in between these, it will continue to work just fine. Okay, um, I have had at least one person that I know who's had a lot of experience with a different library called Mockery. Uh, if you know Pedraic Brady, he's the author of that one. Um, it has a lot of the same features. It's basically sort of six one half dozen of the other. There's no features so far as I know that one has that the other doesn't that makes it uh, significantly better than the other. Um, I just found that for me personally, Fake's API made more sense when I read it and I, I, I should understand code written using it uh, more easily. Um, that may be a cultural thing, I'm not sure, but if you look at Face API and you don't really quite get it or it just doesn't really click with you, uh, Mockery is, an, is another uh, library that you can check out. Um, I tend to think of it as kind of like Apple or, or Android. People tend to like one and not the other for the most part. Um, the other option that I know of is a library called Prophecy. Uh, PHP unit does actually offer native integration with this library. I haven't looked at it too extensively. I think it was added in 4.5, so it, relatively speaking, it's, it's a recent addition. Um, so I would encourage you mostly just because I have used 
PHP and its native mocking extensively, and I've run into these pain points time and time again, that if you're experiencing some of the same frustrations that you checked out these libraries, uh, it doesn't have to be fake in particular. It's, like I say, it's just the one that I use personally. Um, so that is all the material that I have. Um, if you have any questions, comments, discussion, we can do that now. Um, Obligatory plug, oneiwork.com is the company that I work for. You'll see me wearing your shirt today. Uh, if you want to talk about the company, they're hiring, so I'm here for that. Again, you can go to my site for slides. Uh, you can reach me using all of these. Um, and lastly, again, please, 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 I really appreciate feedback on Joined In, so I would appreciate it if you would leave me some. So, thank you. So any Q&A, anybody have any questions at all? Yes. I think we'll have somebody running back to hand you the mic, sir. Uh, hi, can we integrate fake with PHP spec? Um, I haven't used PHP spec uh, extensively. What I can tell you is that I showed points of integration with PHP unit, but fake, so far as I know, is not dependent on that. It, it does use it for its own unit tests, but in terms of having dependencies, it doesn't depend on PHP unit specifically, so um, not knowing anything again about PHP spec, I would assume theoretically it is possible. Um, I'll have to keep an ear out for anybody who's had that experience. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Hey, so when you run fake verify mm -hmm. and verification fails, I presume it just throws an exception or something because yes. PHP unit, you want it to uh, kind of show a nice error message as if you were using like a cert or something. Yes, that's exactly what happens. So it will throw an exception and cause PHP unit's normal failure behavior to kick in and the exception message will include more information about exactly what caused it to fail. Um, fake is actually very good for that. I've found that it will tell you, okay, you expected this method to be called this many times with these parameters. That's not actually what happened. There was no interaction with this mock or this, uh, this stub was called, but it was called with these different parameters. It, it's very good about denoting exactly what the difference was between what you expected and what actually happened. So, I think we had another one in the back. Hey, um, if you mentioned about if you're mocking a private method, just to use the public method would use it instead. Uh, do you see any problem with just trying to make your private methods protected instead? Um, so, it depends. <laughs> um, my, I've worked in a lot of different settings before. Uh, in one of those, I was responsible for maintaining a framework that a lot of the rest of the company used. Um, I can tell you that depending on the size of your organization, in those sorts of situations, education can be very difficult. So, um, I think Stefan Preach said this best. Uh, and he, be careful when you declare methods as being non-private because at that point you have to maintain them for the rest of your life. <laughs> um, so, in that instance, when we didn't use private methods, quite often I found we gave the other users of the framework enough rope to hang themselves with. So, um, it, I guess yeah, that's the answer really, it's just it depends. Pro protected does make stubbing a lot easier. Um, there are cases where private is called for. Uh, I tend to find it's lesser used, at least in my own code. A lot of other programmers are on the other end of the extreme where they make anything that's not public private by default. So it, it's going to vary as to, you know, if you're dealing with a legacy code base or if you're dealing with a code base that a lot of other users in your company use as to which decision you should make, in my opinion. All right. Anybody else? Yeah. Ah, here we go. Hi. Um, I really like the cleaner APIs. That stuff is brilliant. Uh, and that's coming from experience using um, Mockery. Mm -hmm. So it's very similar stuff. But my question is, does that come at a cost uh, of, say, rather than using PHP unit um, instead? So in terms of, like, I guess, execution time, does it have any uh, impact on uh, the time of running your full test suite? Uh, I mean, I've, honestly, I, I haven't seen that it has. 
Um, it's possible that it would with a test suite that was fairly large. Uh, if there have been any performance studies done in that regard, I'm not aware of them. But in terms of my own personal experience, I haven't noticed a difference. Just notice that the code is a lot cleaner. <laughs> Anybody else? Don't be shy. Three, two, one, no, I'm kidding. Um, all right, well, if you happen to think of a question later or you just don't feel comfortable asking one publicly, please come find me, I'm at your disposal. And thank you again for attending my talk. Leave feedback, thank you. <laughs>